Okay, great. Now that I've got the technical challenges out of the way, I can start. Um, so my name is Rick Trotman. I'm the CEO of Barksdale Resources. Uh, we are based in Canada, as you can see from this photo, right in lovely Vancouver, but we do have a project down here in Mexico. I was going to start this uh, presentation off with a really dirty joke, but uh, a couple of my colleagues talked me out of it. So um, there are a couple of uh, spots in this presentation where hopefully you'll get a bit of a chuckle. So I will be making some forward-looking statements. A lot of what I'm going to be talking about is arm-waving in nature. So, you know, kind of take this all with a grain of salt. It's probably better that way, Paul. Is this better? Yeah? All right. Okay, so Barksdale is an exploration stage company. We have a, a whole portfolio of assets, most of which are in the United States. Uh, and they kind of concentrate around the target definition and testing type phases. Um, these are big, early stage grassroots projects that have large porphyry targets. We also have kind of our crown jewel, uh, which is called Sunnyside. That's the project immediately adjacent to the South 32 Hermosa project. We have a very large SCARN and porphyry system there. We hope to be drilling that at some point here in the near future. Uh, but the topic of my discussion today will be on San Javier, which is our project here in Sonora. Uh, so many of you would probably have seen this project. Um, this is Cerro Verde itself. It's a, a prominent peak that you see as you're driving along Highway 16, uh, heading from San Antonio de la Huerta back to Hermosillo. Uh, this is a copper oxide uh, deposit, which is most likely of a iron oxide copper gold um, affinity. So the project, as I mentioned, is about oh, two hours east of Hermosillo along Highway 16. Um, it's just before you get to uh, Manera Sapuchi, the Osisco Development Project, uh, and the Rio Yaqui. Zooming in a bit more on the district, we have four concession blocks at San Javier. Uh, they're in the blue colors there. Um, they're a bit disparate, but nevertheless cover um, you know, the bulk of the areas that we do want to explore. There are three known copper um, prospects and or deposits on these projects. Um, where we've spent most of our time is on Cerro Verde, which is that uh, blue square on the bottom left-hand corner. That's what we're going to talk about mostly today. And as you can see, this is right next to the highway. That little blue dashed line is the highway. I mean, you can shoot a potato gun from the top of this project and, and hit the highway. All right, I'm a bit of an armchair geologist these days. So, um, you know, forgive me as I walk through some of this stuff. Um, so this is the Cerro Verde concession block. This is the main project. This is the area that's had most of the historic drilling completed in the past. Uh, three main units that are of consequence here. So the, 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 the capping units here are kind of a andesitic breccia flows. Um, kind of in this middle picture here, you can see it's more of a um, kind of monomictic uh, breccia. Um, it provides, uh, it's a bit of a cap rock. Uh, we have andesitic lahars that are more polymictic in nature that sit below that. And then the basal unit here uh, is the coyotes formation uh, conglomerates. So it's pretty easy to see where you've kind of gone down through the bottom of this system. Uh, there are a lot of low angle structures in this deposit uh, that you can see here on the eastern side within the andesitic lahars. Um, what we think has happened here is that this probably much larger deposit back in the day was subsequently faulted off, kind of like a deck of cards that was then subsequently pushed to the, the southwest. So I'll show you a slide later on that shows kind of this string of pearls of deposit that kind of form this north, east, southwest uh, lineation. But these, these low angle structures are pretty important. Uh, they kind of uh, provide uh, some fluid channel pathways. And then obviously, of course, where you hit, um, you know, the major structures, you can have actual displacement between, you know, ore and not ore. Uh, and if you can't pick out this structure here, um, it's right there, um, just right along the uh, center of that guy's waist. The ore itself, um, 
typically comes in, at, oh, it's a typical super gene deposit. Uh, you get flooding of open space, you get replacement of porphyritic material, um, and you actually do see some massive replacements in there, um, you know, in kind of the, 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 the hypogene zones, uh, so to speak. Um, and then what you do see here, which is actually quite spectacular, is uh, you see massive specularite flooding. So we'll have boulders of specular hematite on this property. You see multiple events of specularite veining, um, at least one of those events is associated with actually decent gold values um, on the order of, you know, one to six grams per ton type material. Uh, this is a cross section through Cerro Verde itself. As you can see, this is a tabular style deposit, um, at least in its geometric shape. Um, we've had some pretty good success coming in here and drilling. Um, as you can see, we have large uh, intervals of uh, decent grade copper, uh, this is total copper values, um, so the oxides would be a portion thereof. Um, and we also do see um, some significant gold in there, you know, 20 me 21 meters of a gram and a half, uh, 27 meters of nearly two grams. Now, this is a distinct separate event. Um, the gold hasn't been transported as the copper would have been in that super gene environment, and so the, the zones don't necessarily overlap very well. Uh, when it comes to the known deposit itself, most of the drilling has been completed in that blue oval. Um, uh, I think we have upwards of 40,000 meters, maybe 30 to 40,000 meters in that blue oval. That's going to be the area where our first resource uh, is predominantly focused. Um, as you can see, there are additional areas that we look to concentrate on in terms of expanding this deposit. So particularly in the northeast, um, and on the eastern side of this deposit, we think that this deposit can grow quite substantially. On the south and the western flanks, um, we ultimately will run out of perspective uh, Tarahumara volcanics, and we'll get into the Coyotes conglomerates, so it does pinch out. So there is potential on that side, but not as significant as on the northeast and eastern sides. Um, to, so to step back, and you know, most of the companies here are kind of gold focused. Um, you know, we have a, a copper focus in this company, and I figured it'd be worth a slide or two to just talk about why we like copper, why we're focusing on it, and then how San Javier fits into that equation. And so this is one of the the key metrics that I like to look at when it comes to copper demand. And when you look at um, the growth in both grid generation, storage, and then the EVs themselves, you have fun, fun, uh, like just phenomenal growth rates, right? 20 to 30% compounded annual growth rates over the next 10 years in these sectors. It's going to, to amount to a significant increase in copper demand. That has to come from somewhere. This next slide shows you that over the next couple of years, copper supply is actually supposed to go down, right? A couple hundred thousand tons. While that might not seem, seem significant, the important thing that I like to point out is that in the future, a lot of the, 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 the most substantial copper projects that are going to come into play are com coming from countries that we may not necessarily want to do business with. You've got a lot of political instability in countries like Chile and Peru. Argentina, etc. You have, you know, the Africa, you know, you can kind of judge what's going on over there. And then on the far right of this spectrum, you've got China, which doesn't export. And then you've got Russia, which is basically banned at this point in time. This is going to ultimately culminate in a significant push in my mind in terms of copper prices. And Barksdale wants to be there when that happens. And when it comes to jurisdictions, you know, I like to think about it as kind of fine dining options. When you talk to the majors and, and folks that want to invest money at the end of the day, they're willing to pay up and take a bit more risk in jurisdictions that are high quality. But if you're focused on countries where people can lose all their money, dictators can come in and steal things, uh, for God's sakes, you want that asset de-risked significantly. And for junior mining company, junior explorer, you end up having to spend a significant more amount of money to get the, the other companies to come in and actually either take you out or fund you. So why San Javier? 
why do we think this fits into that kind of global copper picture that I just spoke about? Well, one, it's in a good jurisdiction. Mexico has its faults, I'll give you, but I think there's a lot of upside here in Mexico. 2024 is around the, the, the corner. With a new president, if they, you know, open up staking and do a couple of other things better, I think it's going to be quite the environment in Mexico. So the people that have the projects in Mexico now, they're going to be the first people seated at the dinner table when everyone else comes to play. The other thing I like about San Javier is it's pretty simple. Most of the mineralization that's at Cerro Verde, at least, is on the upper portions of this hill. And at the end of the day, in order to mine it, you're going to lop off the top of that hill, for lack of a simpler way to explain it. And you'll put it onto a heap leach pad off to the west, most likely. Now, the good thing is, once it gets onto that heap leach pad, it's going to perform. So our column tests suggest this is not only going to be a very low acid consumer, but it'll do it without having any agglomeration. So that means we can use a single stage crush. Hopefully our test work in the future will show that this can be run of mine. Um, but you know, when it comes to the oxide materials, we're going to be getting you know, 75 to 90% type recoveries. And that's on a 120 day primary cycle. So if you put an additional lift on that leach or that heap, and you add another cycle on top of it, you'll probably get additional residual recovery off the back of that. So hopefully by the end of the day, you'll be able to recover most, if not all, of the oxides that are in that ore. And at the end of the day, that's going to add significantly to the cost profile, like not having to agglomerate, not having to do one, two, or three stages of crushing. And that's significant. And then when it comes to upside, I talked about the upside at Cerro Verde and the expansion potential, but aside from that, this, this district has a whole series of deposits. As I mentioned before, it seems like displacement has occurred and you've taken one large deposit and spread it out over the, you know, kind of across a district over the course of 10 or 12 kilometers. We have additional prospects here where historic drilling was completed, Mesa Grande and the, the mid-ground, La Trinidad and the bottom of the slide. There's copper there. We just need to go and explore it. I think we got our permits that will allow us to do the exploration drilling last week at these projects. So here in the near future, we'll be kind of going further afield. We'll probably still have drills turning at Cerro Verde to make sure that we can expand it, but other prospects will be looked at all of that would most likely come into a plan that can feed one heap leach pad. And then, as I mentioned before, this is a district play. So these are our concession blocks. Most of the ground here is Monera Sapuche, which is Osisco development. But you can see these orange blobs here. These are other known areas of surface copper mineralization. The green ones are gold mineralization, and then up in the Upper right hand corner on the northeast, that's the old Luz del Cobre mine, which was a, a copper oxide heap leach operation. So we think this is all part of the same system. There's lots of potential in this district. We think that we can probably get resources uh, in the San Javier claim blocks to probably somewhere between one and 150 million tons. And when you start looking at the district scale potential of, you know, deposits potentially that could all feed one central heap, it could get more significant than that. And so at the end of the day, when it comes to San Javier, we've got the expansion potential at Cerro Verde, which will have our resource out here in the next couple of weeks. We've got the exploration project uh, upside, not only on our concessions, but on the concessions elsewhere in the district. Uh, it's a dirt simple project at the end of the day low potential operating costs, heap leach. It should be pretty f straightforward to put that into production. Uh, and then we have a great jurisdiction. Could use a little work, but it's on the up and up. Uh, I would, this is the end of my presentation. I do want to give a, a special thanks to Gambasino Prospector, uh, Jorge and Miguel. They, uh, uh, they have done pretty much all of the geologic work on the project. They do a fantastic job for us. Globe Explore Drilling uh, did all of our drilling work in 2021, and then obviously Mexico Mining Center. So uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, 
that's the end of the presentation. <laughs>